This past Friday, normal work day, had here at the church, Holly sends me a text, I need to stop by Publix on the way home. I'm not usually the one that does groceries. I have no idea where anything is in Publix. I walk in and maybe you've seen them, maybe you are one. I know there are signs above the aisles. You know there's five things on those signs. And there's like 5,000 items in each idol. Idol. Aisle. <laughs> so I pulled up. I'm going on. I walk up to the store. Today will be different. I will not ask anybody for help. I will find everything, five items. What I need, the first four were successful. And I was thinking that this time really was going to be different. Then came the fifth item on the list, shredded cheese. I have no idea where this is. Give me a Bible and I'm fairly comfortable. Give me shredded cheese on the list, and I'm, I'm in China somewhere. No idea what's going on. So I look, I look. It's not any one of the things. Cheese isn't even on, I think, one of those signs above the aisle. So I ask somebody. It looks like they're in green apron. Sure enough, this person did work there. Can you tell me, excuse me, can you tell me where the shredded cheese is? They laugh. I immediately think, thanks. <laughs> Clearly, I must have a sign, lost mail in the grocery store. And then they said this, it's on the other side of the store. <laughs> and I'm thinking, thank you for your unhelpful contribution to my quest for success in the grocery today. Can I get an exact address? <laughs> but of course, I don't say this. I thank them, head to the other side of the store. Of course, don't find it again. So I do. The only thing left to do, I call Holly. <laughs> and I say, quote, there is no shredded cheese in this store. And ironically enough, she laughs, just like the employee. Must be some like inner club where like you people who go to the grocery, you, you know where everything is and you meet together and talk about these things and you laugh at everybody who doesn't know who's not in your club. Anyway, she told me exactly where it was and sure enough, there it is. Did you know there's a difference in shredded cheese? There's fancy cheese and normal cheese. Anyway, I got the right one, walked out, defeated yet again. Funny story, self-deprecating. We enjoy things like this. But I do wonder, we're done with Romans 9 now. In our quest, we've been going through Romans for some time now as a church. About a year, maybe a little bit more. We're done with Romans 9 now, and I've seen some of your faces as we've been going through this hard chapter that is puts forth and displays for us the strong and certain and sure sovereignty of God over all the hearts of all men. And some of you had faces like I did on Friday in Publix. You're lost as you encounter things like this. Well, I hope in our time together, we spend five weeks through that chapter. I hope it's been helpful and you no longer feel like that. But as we come now to chapter 10, two comments before we get into it. We're still first in this big argument of Romans 9, 10, and 11. It's one argument. We're still in the middle of that. But as we come now to chapter 10, second point. 
we return to something of themes that are familiar to us, themes that we've heard before in Romans, justification by faith alone, we're saved by faith alone, comes back, why that is, comes back, what the gospel is, comes back, and now, I think maybe for the first time in Romans, we start to get a sense of gospel urgency as we're hearing, reading in these next three weeks through Romans 10, Lord's Lord willing, that the gospel must go out. And we must be the ones to do this. We are responsible to do this. And so as sovereign as chapter 9 was, God's sovereignty, you love the balance of scripture, chapter 10 is thick responsibility of man. We must embrace both of these. And Lord willing, after all this, none of us will look like I did on Friday in the store looking for the dreaded, shredded cheese. Well, let's enter Romans 10. The points are on the back of the bookmark here. There are three of them. First, see in verse 1, a great heart. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. As soon as we get to chapter 10, verse 1, hopefully we're reminded of chapter 9, verse 1 and following that sounds so similar where Paul says, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. <clears throat> Paul's desire and heart for his fellow Jews, fellow Pharisees, we could say, to come to know the truth is thick. Yes, God is sovereign over the hearts of all men and the affairs of everything that happens on earth. In the universe, there is not one rogue molecule in existence. But that doesn't stop Paul. Notice, full sovereignty does not get rid of Paul's burden for the lost. If anything, he repeats it here. And guess how he starts chapter 11? The exact same way. This repeated theme is crystal clear that we should not rejoice, take delight in those who reject our Savior. Rather, it should be something of an innermost desire of the heart to see the lost come to be found. The blind come to see. The weak made strong. This is a great heart. And this great heart in verse 1 teaches us two things. First, this great heart of the apostle teaches us the heart we must have as those who have been saved by the Lord Jesus. Think about Paul's life. He was a Jew. Pharisee, which I think we can say is something of an Israelite nationalist politically. But when God saved him, it changed everything. He began preaching to his own fellow Jews, convinced of the truth that he had been blinded to. Now he knows and he wants his fellow Pharisees and Jews as kinsmen, according to the flesh, to know the same truth that has so changed his life. So he labors among them to convince them of this. And what do they do? Do they respond? Oh, thank you so much. No, they laugh at him. They mock him. They revile him. They stone him. And they try to kill him. Because they hated him. They saw him as a traitor, a defector, a teacher of new religion. You have departed from the old ways and you have now gone on to a new thing that we cannot follow. 
This is how they viewed Paul. Yet Paul knew they were in error. Paul knew they were blind to the beauty of Christ. They were dead to the infinite glories of God. And how did Paul respond? With his own hatred, with his own mocking, with his own violence? No, Paul responded in Christ-like love. How like Christ is Paul here? How gospel-saturated is this? He's treating them the way God has treated him in the gospel. Welcome to the wandering sinner. And Paul can't but extend the same grace to his enemies. We all know someone, perhaps, perhaps many people, who are similar. Not to Paul, but to those who reject Christ. Maybe it's family members. Maybe it's coworkers. Maybe it's neighbors. Whoever it is. Perhaps these people even are not just in disagreement with us, but upon talking with them about this very most important, most importantest of all issues, perhaps they even get a little antagonistic and they mock, they revile, they keep you out of certain circles. How do you respond to this? Do you immediately avoid this person? You feel rejected, so you're going to treat others the way they treat you? That's the American way. Maybe you hop online. Whatever social media you happen to be into, you you find a meme suited to your position. You find a quote that's going to be a good jab against this person. You know they're going to see it, and you post it happily ha that'll show them or maybe you just don't know what to do with these people if we as the church don't respond to the lost as the church if we're not the church in the world how is the world going to hear the gospel If we retreat and insulate ourselves and say, these four walls for us are safe, let's stay here. How is the city going to hear that there's a greater hope that goes beyond this existence? There's really no excuse we can give to justify our lack of discipline, our lack of effort, energy, use of resources, in getting the gospel out. Even in these days, when Christians are more and more and more marginalized in our culture for all kinds of things, if we don't respond to that in a verse one type attitude, how are they going to see the great heart of the true shepherd? That's the first thing we learn in Paul's great heart. This is something of the heart we need to have have and to cultivate and be encouraging one another to cultivate the second this great heart teaches us how to rightly respond to sovereignty this is one of those objections from romans chapter 9 from full sovereignty and we should be a little bit in wonder a little bit astounded that chapter 10 verse 1 comes after all of chapter 9 Some read chapter 9, they hear of God's sovereignty and salvation, and they come away thinking this. Okay, since God seems to really be like this, since he's sovereign over all things, and there's not a rogue molecule in existence, as you say, there really isn't any point to desiring, being burdened with, or praying that the lost would come to faith. Isn't it already done? Chapter 10, verse 1, not only shows us that that's an unhealthy posture of the heart, not only shows us that's a wrong posture of the heart, 
it shows us that's a sinful posture of the heart. It's wicked to come away thinking that. But the question remains, right? How, how do these things mesh? I'd encourage you to think about it like this. God, in his sovereignty, ordains all things. The end to which all men will arrive. He ordains not only the end which all men will arrive at, that's chapter 9, but he also ordains the means to arrive at that end. That's chapter 10. He ordains the end and the means to get to the end. What then is the means that God uses to save the elect? What is the vehicle God uses to get the elect to salvation? Does God from heaven on his throne just sit back and zap them and they're all saved? No. Does he just, it's done. How are the elect saved? There's only one way to be saved. Through believing in Jesus, through hearing the preaching of the gospel and responding in faith, turning away from sin and turning toward Jesus and trusting him to save you. That's it. So think back to Genesis 1, just as as Eve was to be the helpmate of Adam in exercising dominion over all the world and spreading the image of God to all the nations. Adam was a foreshadow of Christ. That also means Eve then is a foreshadow of the church. So just as Eve was to Adam, so too is the church to Christ. We are the helpmate of Jesus, the bride being used to get the gospel to all nations, to spread the image of God in the world. Who is the image of God? But Jesus. The church, then, is the intended means by which God is going to save the elect through their faithfulness with gospel preaching and gospel spreading. Yes, God is sovereign. Yes, nothing can thwart or frustrate his sovereign purposes. But just because that's true does not give us a justification to not participate in the Great Commission as if it were the Great Suggestion. To not be burdened for the lost is a great sin. That's all there in verse 1. But as we move on from the text to our second heading this morning in verse 2 and 3, we see more of why Paul is so burdened specifically for his own people. We see that his great burden comes because the Jews have a great religiosity. Look at verse 2 first. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Paul speaks very positively at first. You see this? He doesn't immediately find the things wrong and take them to task. You have a zeal. Zeal is great. But then he shows us the rest of the story. In the rest of verse 2, their zeal isn't according to knowledge. Is this verse surprising to you? I wonder if it might, might be. I think it should be because... What's the rule of thumb in our culture today? As long as you're sincere, I think you'll be okay in the end. Fervent sincerity is the same thing as zeal. As long as you're fervently sincere, you're good. I don't care what you believe. But we know Right? Though one can be sincere, you can be sincerely wrong. So.
such were the Jews. And don't forget, such was Paul once. Extremely zealous in his service to God, sincerely believing in his zeal that he was honoring and glorifying, offering a service to God by hunting down this new group called those that followed the way. And then in Antioch later, Christians hunt them down, throw them in jail. I'll hold the coats while you stone Stephen. God is glorified. Hallelujah. Amen. But God interrupted his zealousness, literally blinding him with the beauty of the Lord Jesus and opened his eyes, even though he's blinded to the truth of the gospel. Paul's zeal took a turn. At this moment, he once was zealous for the great traditions and customs of the fathers, of the Pharisees, the most strictest of religious orders. His zeal was great, but it wasn't in accord with truth. Having met and been interrupted by Jesus, his zeal is now in accord with truth which is why his burden is so great because all his fellow kinsmen are still very zealous for all the wrong things. So church, zeal can be great, but zeal without knowledge is like a bazooka in the hand of a three-year-old. Anyone could get blown up. But what is this knowledge, right? If we're going to know this, zeal according to knowledge, what is this knowledge in verse 2 referring to? Well, keep going. We see the knowledge in verse 3. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Righteousness. Righteousness is the issue. Righteousness is what they were ignorant of. It was God's righteousness that they weren't submitting to. That's the root of the issue in their ignorance here. How so? We got to go back a little bit and retrace the story up to this moment. Do you know there are really two ways to be saved? Am I contradicting myself? I said there's only one earlier, right? You'll see. After receiving the Ten Commandments, God's law, from Mount Sinai a second time, remember Moses slammed them on the ground after the golden calf incident. So Deuteronomy 5 happened. That's the second time they received the law. At the very end of this giving of the law, Moses tells the people this. This is Deuteronomy 6.25. It will be righteousness, key word, for us. If we are careful to do all this commandment before the Lord our God. This verse teaches us that Israel would have been saved. It would have been righteousness for them if they had perfectly, flawlessly, in every law, perfectly obeyed the law of God that they had received. So there's two ways to be saved. You either obey all of God's law in all of its entirety at all times and never falter. Or you trust in the one who did it for you. What did he tell the rich young ruler? After giving the commandments, he's like, what is the law command of you? And he spouted it back out. What did Jesus say? You're wrong. Do this and you'll live. Quoting Leviticus 18.5, which ironically Paul's going to quote next in verse 5 of Romans 10. We're not there yet, though. We'll get there next week, Lord willing. So Israel, having received the law, hearing that it will be righteousness for them if they obey, sets their sights to that goal. Righteousness is the goal. But their history shows that they did not attain it. They fell far short of that goal. But at this moment, they didn't, they could have, they didn't turn back to God in desperation. 
acknowledge their sin, plead for forgiveness, and see what God would do. They didn't return to the law, reread it to see if they were reading it rightly. Maybe our understanding of it's off. Let's, let's go back. No, you know what they did in the history of the Jewish people and Israelites as they come through the Old Testament? We can't keep God's law. So they invented all kinds of other laws that they can keep. And because they could keep these things, they convinced themselves they really were keeping God's law and therefore consider themselves to be altogether righteous. It will be righteousness for us if we obey this law. What law? The laws that we have made. And so, new laws, new ceremonies, new rituals, new rites, all kinds of things came into being. That's what verse 3 is talking about. Being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness ultimately led them to not submitting to God's righteousness. Where is God's righteousness revealed? In the law. They truly had zeal. And they were very religious. But they missed the point entirely. It was their great religiosity that blinded them to the truth. This error in verse 2 and 3, we still make today. Let's explore that. Zeal is not a guarantee that one knows the truth. If the personality is large enough, you can gain any kind of following. There was a college professor that was famous when I was a student at Valdosta State University, 2004-ish. He was an anthropology professor. He was well-known on campus, probably not famous elsewhere, but was well known for his great fervor in taking Christians in particular and deconverting them with the truth of anthropology. And one of our close friends fell to this. He was convinced of foolish arguments. And he went astray and believed this professor. And I took a few of his classes. I wanted to see what this was all about. And his argument held water as much as uh, a whole a, a whole bucket, a bucket with holes. It was plain as day. The truth he was talking about, he'd apply to every religion. It's all made up. It's all just symbols that you attach meaning to and then live in line with. It's all fake. You know what he never did? apply that thinking to his own opinions, his own meaning, his own importance, and things like this. He failed to see that he was just as religious as the people he was trying to de-religionize. It just looked a lot different for him. Zeal gained him a great following, and it was for great evil. Haven't we all had zealous Mormons, zealous Jehovah's Witnesses knock on our door? Weren't the Muslims who flew into the towers zealous for the Islamic faith? Zeal is no guarantee of truth. But perhaps closer to home, Christian zeal can often go amiss as well. One can be zealous for right doctrine and miss the God of the doctrine. One can be zealous for church growth and expansion and miss the Christ who's expanding his church globally. One can be zealous for Sunday school, for church attendance, for Bible reading, for small groups, for ministry, this ministry, that ministry, for Christian radio, Christian bumper stickers, Christian t-shirts. You find a little niche, you'll find a fanatic too. Even us Christian parents, we can be very zealous in teaching our kids to act very Christianly. 
But why do we do that? Is it because we want God to be glorified? Well, truly in part, yes, but isn't there times where we want them to act Christianly so we're not embarrassed at their bad behavior publicly? We don't want the shame. Oh, they're clearly not doing their parenting. (laughs) One more example. We, Holly and I, were once part of a congregation that did expand their building. They they built a, a big gymnasium. And on it was multi-level building on the top floors. There were all sorts of brand new classrooms that we wanted to use this space to perhaps serve the city with various sporting things to have larger meetings in. We wanted maybe there's a school, a Christian school that needs a home. Let's build this. If they're not going to use it, maybe we can do Sunday school here or our own education or doctrinal teaching for whatever the heck we want to do. And so this was a thing. It was built and most people were super excited and it was so nice. And then sure enough, a local school that we had already been kind of partnering with approached us and said, hey, is that available? And we were like, yeah. And they were like, can we move in? And like 95% of the church was gung-ho and yes. But sure enough, no joke, there was a small minority that said, no. They're going to ruin the carpet. Really? All sorts of bent out of shape and zealous for the wrong reasons. The error of verse 2 and 3 is so present today. Anytime the traditions of man become more important than God, we are in verse 2 and 3. We show ourselves to be ignorant of God's righteousness. We show ourselves to be working to establish our own standard of righteousness. Ultimately, we show ourselves, God, I get righteousness. Yours is not my interest. This is what I really think it's about. And we reject him for doing so. This this is done in various ways, some more pronounced than others, and I'll leave it to our small groups, this is a good thread to pull to talk about how we all do this in various ways and how we need to repent of them. The problem, I think we get, great religiosity. But what's the remedy? Verse 4, our third heading, a great Savior. For, notice the connecting words here, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Earlier I mentioned in verse 2 and 3 that the problem with Israel was inventing all kinds of new laws, ceremonies, rituals, and rites that they could keep. And when they kept these, they truly did convince themselves and justify, we are all together righteous. See, we're keeping the law. All these hundreds and thousands of little bitty things you can't do that... Ironically, Jesus came and broke those, all of them, and shoved it in their face. Probably not that. That's probably too much. But what they missed was the righteousness of God. If we go back to Romans 7, verse 7 to 12, we remember why God gave the law. We sang about it. Your perfect law exposes me. I see my sin in desperate need the law was given not to save but to slay to point out where we go amiss to hold before us as if a mirror god's righteous standard and say hey do you measure up no one does but the law ultimately and opening up all these wounds and exposing us, the law chases us to the foot of the cross where we look up and see the one who was perfect and who did satisfy every demand of the law in his life and in his death. 
living for us, dying for us, raised for us. This Christ is the one in whom all the law is fulfilled. In this way, verse 4 says, Jesus is the end, the purpose, the termination point of God's law, such that those who come to Christ in faith, what's the result? They are given his perfect righteousness. Think about verse 4. Christ is the end of the race as a, sorry, the end of the law as a race. I'm a little backwards today. The finish line of a race is nice. The race is over. The gruelingness of competition is at an end. But think about what the finish line is. It is both the end of the race, but it's also the goal of the race. It's the termination point of all that began, but it's also all that everything is looking forward to. This is what Jesus is in terms of the law. And this is why he said in Matthew 5, 17, I've not come to abolish the law. I've come to fulfill it. I am the end that it was always meant to arrive at. If you're chased by the commandments of God, you will arrive at the son of God. That's what this means. That is the end of the law. Yet, when Jesus came on the scene, when Christmas happened and Jesus began doing great works and revealing himself to whom he sees fit, this is the sovereign God of the universe, they missed it. They missed it. The Jews were so taken up with their own zeal, their own busyness with religious things with their own traditions, their own rites and customs and rules that they entirely missed him. Even though they were the ones that these great promises about his coming were made to. They missed Christ and they should have known better. In Martin Lloyd-Jones like fashion, do you feel the question that's pressing down on us right now? They missed it. Have you? Have you missed it entirely? Many have grown up in the church. All they know is church. Some of them I go to school with, and they're getting their doctorate. Well, I've always been in church, so I guess I'll just work in the church. They're very zealous, people inside the church. But are they zealous for the right things? Or are they zealous for the things that they think makes one righteous or unrighteous? This passage wakes us up. It's like an alarm clock for us to the reality that you can be zealous for God, even zealous for righteousness, and entirely miss it and be lost yourself. Ever since the fall of man into sin... Man has been seeking righteousness in countless fallen and corrupt ways through our man-made customs, causes, rites, and rituals. In that light, do you remember our call to worship today? The woe that Mike began with, that I asked him to begin with? Woe to the shepherds. These would become Pharisees who destroy the sheep, who scatter the sheep. How are they destroying and scattering? By asking them, causing them, commanding them to live in line with their own traditions rather than God's. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning these shepherds who care for my people, you have scattered the flock. You've driven them away. You have not tended to them. 
Behold, I will tend to you for your evil deeds, declares the Lord. Then, after I've dealt with you, false shepherds, I will gather. God is a gathering God. I will gather my remnant from the four corners of the nations. Even here to Israel, the nations are in view. Missions is in view. Spreading is in view. I will draw them out from their countries where I've driven them. I'll bring back their fold and they shall be fruitful and shall multiply. Genesis 128 echoes much. And I will set shepherds over them who care for them. And no one will fear anymore or be dismayed. No one will be missing, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. And he shall reign. He will be wise and he will execute justice and righteousness. And in his days, is this branch of David, capital B, still alive? The Lord Jesus, in his days, all of Judah, all God's people will be saved. And Israel, God's people, Jew and Gentile now, the new Israel, will dwell securely. And this is the name that we'll call Jesus, the Lord, our righteousness. Not seeking our own, but trusting in the one who's righteous for us. That's the goal, the end, the purpose of the law that Jeremiah even is reminding them of. Paul is not an innovator. All he's doing in his writing is knowing and explaining the Old Testament in light of Jesus. So church... Those who are truly righteous are not those who are always filled with religious kind of zeal. The truly righteous ones, verse 4, are those who live by faith. We could end there, but let's press it a little bit more. If you open social media, how many of you are on social media? Just by a show of hands. I really admire you guys who are not. My hand goes up in that one too. It is immediately apparent that the world is not lacking zeal today, is it? It's just, no, right? You get on Twitter, wow, this is such an encouraging community. I just feel so fluffy and warm, warm and soft pillows everywhere on Twitter. No, it's daggers and bazookas everywhere, isn't it? It's... I believe this, hashtag, you're not brave enough to repost. <laughs> hashtag, Rudy. There is one of those that was funny. We're not lacking zeal today. Everybody seems to be zealous for something. Can we have a personal moment as a church? I'm on social media. So are some of you. I read occasionally what you write. You, Sunrise, are not lacking in zeal. Some of you are zealous for the wrong things. Energy expended in the wrong direction. Passion given to things that are not eternal. We need something of a recovery of what truly matters. I think we do. I would love in this, the next election's already coming up, right? Probably. They're priming for it. Who's it going to be? DeSantis something, right? That's what people are saying. How great would it be if we as a community 
could encourage other Christian communities, especially outside our country, and display in our lives, especially our social media lives, the thing that matters most to us is not so much who becomes president, but who's the king of kings over all these pawns. Could we do that? Vaccine this, mandate this, anti-vax that, whatever. Be zealous for the right things. You will not regret spending and giving your life, pouring it out as a drink offering, like Paul explains, in service of the gospel. You'll regret everything else. You'll never regret this. Spend and be spent for this. Let's pray.